Thank you, David, for that really kind introduction. And thank you both to you and Guluru, or should I say to David Pasha and Guluru Hanum. We were discussing what title David would take if he were Turkish. And he, he said he liked Pasha, so Pasha's good. Thank you both for having me here. It's um, thrilling and kind of weird to be an Aga Khan fellow because, of course, I was a student and I remember very well, not in this building, but back in the Sackler, kind of attending these talks. And um, it's, it's bizarre being um, on, on this side of the podium instead. Um, the talk I'm going to give this evening relates to a, a new book project. And I'm going to sort of be a bit weird and give two introductions as a result. One is to the broader project. And then I'm going to zoom in on, to, on the topic of the actual talk. So there'll be sort of two introductions, um, one laying out the, the reasons for this project more generally. So um, it's early enough in the term that I can, or in the year, that I can legitimately say uh, this is a work in progress. So please judge it charitably. And I look forward to your uh, questions and comments at the end. You are what you wear. It's a familiar saying and one that almost all of us bear out in our day-to-day -day clothing choices. Fashion is, after all, a key component of what Stephen Greenblatt almost 40 years ago termed self-fashioning, the construction of a socially acceptable and legible identity determined by one's outward appearance and conduct. Invoked in both its senses by Greenblatt's concept, the word fashion is not alone in referring to modes of dress as well as to modes of action. Costume and custom are etymological twins, while the word habit once referred as much to clothing as it did to behavior, a sense that modern English preserves in relation to clerical attire. Few societies have been as closely identified with their dress as the Ottomans, whose costumes were a continual source of fascination for foreign visitors to their empire. Suffice it to quote the famous 17th century Roman traveler Pietro della Valle, who in 1614 wrote in a letter sent from Istanbul, quote, I saw many other curiosities in the various kinds of dress that were worn, because all the different officers and ranks, in the militia as well as in the court, and every other sort of person, have their own kind of garb here, and people reveal what they, what they are, particularly by what is worn on the head, unquote. Similar observations appear time and again in European writings on the Ottoman Empire, and though at first sight unremarkable, such statements raise the question of why, in a world where dress codes and sumptuary laws were near universal, the Ottomans were repeatedly noted for their sartorial hierarchy. It would be easy to explain this phenomenon as a result of mere exoticization of the proximate other. But, as we shall see, the Ottomans themselves were scarcely less convinced of the special significance of what they wore. Paralleling the semantic equations made in European languages, the Ottoman word for costume, kiafet, also refer to the pseudoscience of physiognomy, a sense imported from the term's Arabic source, kiafa. This widely shared belief that clothes, as, sorry, this widely shared belief that clothes as much as manners made the Ottoman man is a starting point for my project, which seeks to investigate how and why costume became such a frequent and meaningful site of interaction between the Ottoman Empire and the outside world. Though I will, of course, consider the role of clothing itself in this interaction, my interest lies mainly in representations of costume, and more specifically in Ottoman representations made for Western audiences. And it's partly to signal the parameters of my project that my working title um, of the book, which is also the working title of this talk, includes the word Turkish, paraphrasing the way that Europeans historically refer to the Ottoman Empire and its peoples. Running the gamut from painted costume albums to exhibitions and clothed mannequins, the works and displays that I plan to address date from the late 16th to the 19th century, bridging the early modern and modern periods. I'm still trying to determine how to deal manageably and coherently with this rather overwhelming abundance of material, excuse the pun. And I envisage a book that, you didn't get the pun, did you material, clothes, you know, anyway. <laughs> And I envisage a book that consists of a number of thematic case studies rather than one that attempts anything resembling a comprehensive survey. Whatever form my project ends up taking, I'm anxious to avoid considering such art artworks principally from the perspective of their European consumers, which has been the tendency thus far. 
and to foreground instead the Ottomans' own share in determining European interest in and notions of the costumes and customs of their empire. More than being simply representations then, the artworks with which I shall be dealing also constituted a kind of self-representation, which, though undoubtedly responsive to Western expectations, was rooted above all in Ottoman processes of self-fashioning. So much for my general introduction. In what remains of my time, I'm going to turn my attention to costume albums as a way of exploring one of the most interesting aspects of my overall topic, interesting to me at least, and that is the tension that exists throughout my, my material between claims to veracity on the one hand and the tendency toward formulaicness on the other. Costume books, and here I mean costume books in general, are by nature repetitive. Their very function, to show the characteristic dress of particular groups of people, relies on and reinforces established markers of communal identity, the depiction of which necessarily results in standardized visual sequences that invite taxonomic comparison. Unavoidable as it may be, such recurrence of thematic and pictorial topoi runs counter to another defining attribute of costume books, and that is their professed or assumed reliability. How can we trust that what we are seeing is a true and current picture rather than so much recycled so, sorry, rather than so many recycled stock figures? This issue presents itself especially clearly in the case of costume books pertaining to the Ottoman Empire, not only because of their preponderance, they constitute perhaps the largest subset of the genre, but also because they are themselves divided into, do, into two dialogically related and mutually influential categories one consisting of Western-produced representations and the other of actual Ottoman works. Overwhelmingly made for foreign consumption, the latter, in other words, the Ottoman works, took the form of painted albums that survive in hundreds of examples, ranging in date from the late 16th to the first half of the 19th century. The relationship of these albums to European costume books grew more pronounced and convoluted in the final phase of their long history when new conditions of image making brought about greater aesthetic and thematic homogeneity between the two traditions. In particular, the rise of a more naturalistic manner of album painting at the end of the 18th century paved the way for printed European copies that made no acknowledgement of their Ottoman source material. I'll return to these images later, so forgive the lack of captions, it will also become clearer later, but in a way I'm sort of trying to confuse you by juxtaposing these very similar images. It is this increasingly entangled picture that I, that I wish here to examine with you, focusing on how Ottoman and Western producers and reproducers vied with varying success to distinguish their portrayals as authentic and original in the face of growing standardization. As well as considering the stylistic and technical reasons for these intensified patterns of repetition, circulation, and competition, I shall also discuss the role that reforms in Ottoman costume itself played in limiting and ultimately stifling the album painter's ability to market their product in what had become an increasingly uniform visual landscape. Diminished in relevance and appeal by these unfavorable circumstances, the albums gave way in the second half of the 19th century to new modes of sartorial self-representation that not only answered the changing interests of contemporary audiences, but also serve the empire's own modernizing image, as I shall address towards my conclusion. Western portrayals of so-called Turkish dress came to the fore in a variety of artistic contexts, the most important for our purposes being the costume book, which emerged as a genre in Italy and Northern Europe during the first half of the 16th century and flourished throughout the continent thereafter. Sometimes hand-painted, but more usually printed, these costume books typically contained multiple images of diver diversely attired figures shown individually or in lineups, with accompanying inscriptions describing their respective identities. Some books dealt with multiple geographical regions, such as this one, while others were devoted to single nations or polities. In all cases, they reflected a widespread belief that one could understand a society by what its constituent members wore. As we've already seen, the Ottomans received particular attention in this regard, their dress codes being perceived as especially elaborate and codified. 
representations of, of costume thus came to play a key role in Western endeavors to better understand the ways of the Ottoman Empire, a state that was, after all, among the major powers of Europe, connect, connected to the Christian West not only through warfare, but also, and more often, through trade and diplomacy. Together with an increase in travel, the heightened mercantile and diplomatic exchanges that marked the early modern period helped to explain why it was in the 16th century that Ottoman-themed costume books first arose. These same conditions also engendered related pictures in other kinds of works, including illustrated travel accounts, and testifying to the theme's political significance, a series of Habsburg albums showing scenes of Ottoman political and daily life painted by artists attached to ambassadorial missions. And I should point out, actually, that this costume book, which I just showed, is also the work of a Habsburg diplomatic aspect, uh, artist. So, you know, the sort of um, the inseparability of the political and the artistic, or, or, or the sartorial here, is really evident in such works as these. As I've already indicated, such emphasis on Ottoman costume was not mere fetishization on the part of Westerners. The Ottoman authorities, for their part, insisted on strict sartorial differences as a means of making manifest the hierarchical, professional, and confessional stratification of the empire's populace, whose unusual diversity did indeed necessitate a correspondingly rich and codified culture of dress. Conforming to and sometimes challenging these codes, Ottomans of all stripes were deeply involved in strategies of self-fashioning. So central was clothing to this concern that, even in death, as you see here, Ottoman Muslim men were careful to distinguish themselves by means of headdress, their tombstones typically carved with replicas of the turbans they had been entitled to wear in life. Foreigners, too, were implicated in this taxonomy, as when European ambassadors were compelled to wear Ottoman kaftans over their own national dress before being presented to the Sultan, much to the chagrin of certain representatives who balked at having their own carefully fashioned visages effaced by these so-called robes of honor. Perhaps that because they could relate to outsiders' fascination for their attire, Ottoman artists soon realized that they might themselves feed this interest. And by the beginning of the 17th century, the painters of Istanbul were, sorry, the painters of Istanbul were creating their own costume albums for the stream of Western visitors and diplomats passing through the empire. Although, as we shall see, they borrowed a number of themes favored in the European books, these albums were rival wares rather than imitations. Their standard format, a bound codex whose pages are each mounted with a gouache painting of a usually single figure against a plain background, this format may resemble that of their Western counterparts, but it has more immediate analogues in Ottoman court art, where albums containing single figure paintings acquired popularity starting in the later 16th century. And um, I would be, it would be very remiss of me not to mention here Emine Fedvaja, who's about to publish a book on this album on the right, and also David Roxburgh, who's written uh, the book on the Persian album tradition, which lies behind this. Uh, sorry, where was I? Here we go. Less quotidian in subject, ma subject matter and higher in quality than their costume book counterparts, such courtly albums were, were nonetheless filled with comparable figural types wearing a diverse range of attire. This elite art form, which the Ottomans adapted from Iranian models, was taken up during the 17th century by ascendant groups of commercial painters who made more affordable versions for sale in Istanbul's bazaars. Our costume albums were thus embedded in a locally burgeoning artistic practice that spanned the court and the market, and despite the differences between them, all of these Ottoman album categories are clearly the handiwork of men who worked in overlapping professional spheres and shared common technical and stylistic approaches. The artists behind the costume albums were then readily able to respond to Western tastes by customizing genres and themes with which they were already familiar. The mechanisms by which their output was bought and sold are little known, but we should probably imagine multiple competing ateliers, shops, and market stalls offering both off-the-shelf and bespoke albums. And it's worth noting in this regard that um, Evliya Chelebi, and we can't have an Ottoman talk without mentioning him, um, that Evliya Chelebi tells us that um, 
A thousand commercial artists could be found plying their trade in one building alone, a converted church in Istanbul. Um, he isn't referring to costume albums in particular, and uh, of course we know his penchant for hyperbole, so you know, take the number with a grain of salt, but his words are nonetheless important for giving, giving us a sense of how large and vibrant this sphere of commercial painting was. Surviving examples of, of our costume albums typically consist of around 100 images, many of them captioned in European languages by their owners. It is difficult to say how widely circulated the albums were once they were taken to Europe, but there is good evidence that their viewership extended well beyond those who actually purchased them, encompassing armchair travelers and other interested parties also. Whether of Western or local artistry, all early modern portrayals of, portrayals of Ottoman costume demonstrated a propensity for repetition, cross-fertilization, and outright copying even when supposedly executed from direct observation. A revealing case in point is the popular theme of women walking to the hammam, the representation of which employed a recurrent set of stock figures that can be traced back to a, a woodcut executed in uh, 1553 by the Flemish artist Peter Kirke van Est. Uh, that's up here in the corner, it's a detail of that engraving. Um, who had traveled to Istanbul 20 years before his print was published. Part of a wedding procession in Kirka's print, these figures, one carrying an infant on her shoulders and two with domical containers on their heads, were repurposed in various combinations for scenes of women on their way to bathe, including an engraving from the famous travelogue of the French geographer Nicolas de Nicolet, published in 1568, this one here, and several paintings in Habsburg albums of the 1570s and 1580s. From these sources, the topos was appropriated in the 17th century and perpetuated thereafter by Ottoman painters who reused a number of telltale poses and props from the Western originals. It would not have taken long for collectors of such imagery to spot the numerous commonalities between them. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but <laughs> This figure's arm, in a really extraordinary fashion, kind of snakes behind her back and then <laughs> reappears down here as if there's someone behind her. It's, it's, it's a really charming image. Um, and these are two more that I threw in at the last minute, so please excuse the lack of captions, but these are 18th century versions, both in the Bibliothèque Nationale, and you know, they, they show how, how enduring this um, theme was. Conformity to well-received models was, of course, an accepted feature of traditional image-making East and West, and did not automatically cast doubt on a picture's worth. To judge from how prevalent the practice was, many viewers seem to have been quite happy for an artist to reshape ostensibly personal observations in accordance with admired pictorial formulae. It's worth stressing that these Habsburg ones, actually all of these, um, apart from the Ottoman one, which never carried this explicit claim, were made by artists who claimed to have seen these scenes in person firsthand. So it kind of undercuts that claim when you see this motif repeated again and again. Um, sorry, one moment. So even though there seems to have been widespread acceptance of, of this practice of repeating uh, well-regarded pictorial formulae, I believe that at least some consumers were wary of the more egregious instances of plagiarism and anxious to obtain more reliable treatments of the subject. Western portrayals were necessarily at a disadvantage in this regard, for although the majority were the work of men who had spent time in the empire and claimed to have based their images on personal study, the most widespread examples were published as uncolored prints, which laid bare the genre's mediated, incomplete, and reiterative character. Ottoman albums, by contrast, came with an inbuilt guarantee of their documentary value, that did not rely on the biographical reputation of their creators, where Kirke and Nicolet had to advertise the circumstances under which they recorded their subjects, the anonymous Ottoman painters were accepted at face value as insiders. This important point of, point of difference would explain why the locally authored albums gained in popularity against their Western counterparts in the 17th century, despite being no less conventionalized I need to do kind of the, the uh, data-related work to show this, but I am pretty convinced that the painted Ottoman album started to, or, uh, uh, became more popular than um, 
Western depictions uh, in the 17th century. Uh, native painters could, after all, be depended upon to update even the most hackneyed of stock types in tandem with new fashions, always producing a current full color and informative local rendition of the established model. They often pressed their advantage further by making a more obvious show of their privilege behind the scenes access. Several albums thus developed the theme of female bath goers by depicting undressed women washing themselves inside the hammam, a sight impossible for any foreign male to witness, but one that Ottoman men could have experienced as children um, accompanying their mothers. Moreover, almost every album conforms to, and thus reveals, a homegrown conception of hierarchy, typically beginning with a portrait of the reigning sultan, before descending through the courtly, military, and religious ranks to male townspeople, after whom come women, non-Muslims, and foreigners. And I should say that there's some disagreement among those of us currently working on these albums as to whether the images were bought as loose sleeves and, and sort of curated and, and um, mounted by their uh, Western buyers, or whether they were bought already bound as books. Um, for reasons I can expand on in the Q&A, I believe that the majority of examples were bought as existing compilations and therefore reflect an, an Ottoman organizational principle. Another assurance of the album's credibility was their Ottoman stylization, characterized by the use of crisp, dark outlines, vibrant colors that are minimally modeled, if at all, fine sartorial details, and a non-naturalistic representation, representational approach unconcerned with Renaissance conceptions of linear perspective. Here was a pictorial mode that would have struck any Westerner as divergent from European norms, and the contrast appears to have been welcomed. In the letter from which I quoted earlier, Pietro della Valle, having hinted at the variety of costumes he had seen, goes on to tell his correspondent, quote, but I shall not strive to describe these things, because when I return to Rome, I shall bring a book of colored figures, which I have already commissioned, in which all the diverse clothes of every sort, both of, both of the men and of the women of this city, will be drawn from life. And even if they're not sk depicted skillfully, but as the Turks know how, being simply painters of pots, all the same, the clothes will be shown in, in a lifelike way. And as such, I believe they will be looked at uh, with delight in Italy, unquote. I should have actually shown this slide, Rod, because we don't have his album, but this is a, the kind of album he would have been talking about. This is one that's in Venice now. Uh, the implication of um, uh, 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 Pietro della Valle's words, you know, that, that these are not depicted skillfully, but nevertheless are uh, shown in a lifelike way. The implication here is that one kind of artlessness betokens another. That is, that the supposed primitivism of the images guarantees that they show the unadorned truth. The English traveler Peter Mundy expressed a similar sentiment in his diary about an album he purchased in 1618. I quote, for the several habits used at Istanbul, where most officers and nations are distinguished by their habits, I have a little book only of that particular painted by the Turks themselves in anno 1618 although no great art therein, yet enough to satisfy concerning the matter." Unquote. Such connoisseurial snobbery belongs to a predictable Western discourse and should be taken with a pinch of salt. Even if European viewers regarded the Ottoman manner as inferior to their own, they would not have consumed the album so avidly had they considered them unattractive. Mundy's criticism is belied by his own album, which remarkably has survived, and that's what you're seeing there, and is today in the British Museum. As well as, being in, uh, sorry, as well as being among the most beautiful and with its decorative decoupage, unusual examples to have come down to us, this little book so engaged its owner that he filled its blank spaces with his own vivid account of Ottoman society, textually affirming the value attached to such objects as visual and material synecdoches of the empire at large. The sheer number in which the albums survive in Western collections is proof enough that Ottoman artists had hit upon a winning formula, one that depended in no small part on the book's manifest and authenticating aesthetic otherness. Um, we'll just talk a little bit more about Mundi's album. It really is spectacular. And some of the paintings actually bear comparison with, with the courtly level of production. They're really that good. 
Um, so this text, as I just said, was written by Mundi himself, and it's a really kind of interesting document of the kinds of um, uh, thoughts and memories that such paintings could evoke, because it sort of veers on the one hand from recollections of his own experience to, quote, chunks taken from other books, which he acknowledges, so he acknowledges his source material. Sometimes the text is very tight, closely key to the images. In other times, it sort of, you know, takes the images as a starting point and goes off and does something very different. Um, here's another um, uh, opening. Anyway, it's absolutely fascinating. And I believe now in the reinstallation of the British Museum's Islamic galleries, they've put it on display. So if you go to the British Museum, um, you, you can see it there on display in the new Islamic galleries. As well as impressing their viewers, albums like Mundi's also proved inspirational to Western artists, who during the 17th and 18th centuries modified their approach in ways that clearly drew on the expertise of their Ottoman competitors. Unwilling to lose their edge, the album painters in turn looked to and selectively adapted elements of what their rivals had to offer. By the 1780s, this artistic back and forth yielded what was to be the final iteration of the costume book genre, establishing a rather predictable sequence of types and poses that would hold sway into the 1820s. The level of standardization seen here went beyond what it obtained in the earlier period, but its effects were offset in ways that continued to flaunt the real time inside a perspective of the painters, who constantly tweaked the basic scheme in response to changing circumstances. The modifications they made ranged from minor sartorial updates to the replacement of the reigning sultan's portrait and the introduction of other brand new figures, particularly female types. As before, it is when juxtaposed with their Western interlocutors that the Ottoman albums fully disclose their distinctive informational value. So here I'm showing you um, three images. So the one on the left is, is a Western print and the uh, the one on the, in the middle and on the right, these are from Ottoman painted albums that all deal with street vendors carrying trays on their head. And you can see in, in the Western, and this, this um, theme seems to have originated with the Western print. So the Ottoman painters sort of then uh, reclaimed it as it were. You can see in the Western version, uh, this sort of stool is, is just a prop for um, sort of to, to better pose, more elegantly pose the figure. Whereas in the Ottoman versions, we see the, the way that this stool was actually used to help support the trades. It's more sort of informationally rich, uh, the, the Ottoman version of this theme. More striking than such differences as we see here, however, is a new and far-reaching point of overlap. For, as you've probably noticed, the albums had by now moved to a naturalistic approach that clearly drew on Western aesthetic norms. Far from being a concession to foreign tastes, this development was part of a broader and self-determined shift in Ottoman visual culture that had started earlier in the 18th century. And I had to get a bit of Ottoman Baroque in there. Uh, the empire was striving at the time to rebrand itself a modern player in the European political landscape. And this endeavor was accompanied by a showily cosmopolitan turn in the arts that was, as I've argued elsewhere, purposefully designed to resonate on the world stage. In painting, a new naturalistic style came to the fore its main practitioners being Ottoman Greeks and Armenians, who enjoyed long-standing mercantile and cultural ties with Western Europe. The albums belong then to the same visual realm as Ottoman court portraiture of this period, underscoring the genre's continued rootedness in local practice. Nevertheless, a, a corollary of such naturalism was that the stylistic gap between the albums and their Western equivalents narrowed. This convergence might, on the one hand, have proved a commercial boom, enabling Ottoman painters to undercut the claimed technical preeminence of European art. Yet, as we have seen, the otherness of traditional Ottoman painting was, despite its disparagement, almost certainly a selling point, the loss of which brought Western and Ottoman artists into closer confrontation. One outcome of this changed dynamic was to enable more or less direct copying from one group to the other, a phenomenon exemplified by the book The Costume of Turkey, which was published in London in 1802. You can see the whole thing on Google Books, which is where I got this from, and which was published in London in 1802 and contains 60 hand-colored engravings with accompanying descriptions in English and French. <clears throat> 
Its anonymous, boast, sorry, its anonymous author boasts in the preface of having consulted the most reliable accounts of the Ottoman Empire, in the same breath telling the reader that he's referred also, quote, to that admirable work, The Arabian Nights, unquote. Clinching the book's reliability, or claims reliability, are its plates, which the preface assures us were copied, coloring and all, from, quote, drawings made on the spot about four years ago by Monsieur Octavian Dalvimar, unquote. No further information is given about the artist and all other mentions of him in the sources that I could find curiously or dubiously circle back to this book. So did he exist or not? Leaving aside the question of Dalvimar's authorship, most of the images are patently derived, if not lifted, from contemporary Ottoman costume books, something that would have been impossible for Western artists to do before the stylistic realignment of the late 18th century. It is interesting to note that the claim of French artistry for the plates, presumably to enhance their connoisseurial appeal, is counterbalanced by a guarantee of their having been drawn from life. Combining Ottoman insights in, uh, with a new style now consistent with Western canons, the later albums lent themselves perfectly to this sort of appropriation and repackaging. Such plagiarism was not without its risks, however, and details were apt to get lost or corrupted in translation. So note here in the Ottoman versions, uh, what's on the, this is the uh, chief harem eunuch, what's on his head is a kind of loaf-shaped turban and um, you know, Dalvimer, or, or acclaimed artist of the costume of Turkey, has misunderstood this as a kind of, um, as a piece of fabric draped over the head. So you can see that, you can sort of see up the drapery here. So it's a complete misunderstanding of what should be a solid turban. And then this image uh, then gets borrowed further into other compilations. And you can see that the eunuch goes from being, uh, he's still labeled um, Kazara, which means the chief uh, harem eunuch, but he goes from being black as he should be, to becoming progressively white as the source material becomes sort of misunderstood in a game of telephone almost. Sorry, actually I'll go back to that later. Um, Ottoman artists for their part seem to have recognized a need to reaffirm the particularities of their approach if their albums were to stand out in this new context. They were fortunate in this regard to be living in one of the most volatile periods in Ottoman history, marked by fast-paced shifts that were, far, that were far more effectively captured in fresh paint than in the fixed imagery of printed books. Some of the album paintings registering these changes were thus without direct parallel, standing in contrast to the otherwise familiar cast of characters into which they're integrated. Take, for example, this depiction of a soldier with a gun, which comes from a set of loose album paintings that were never bound and are today at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. Both his trim uniform and the Greek graphite caption on the back of the page tell us that he is a member of the Nizam Jadid, or New Order, a small new infantry founded in 1794 by the reformist Sultan Selim III. Trained and equipped according to Western models, the Nizam Jadid proved unwelcome to the Janissaries, the Ottoman army's old elite infantry, who in 1807 rose up against Selim and forced him to disband his creation before toppling him from the throne. Our soldier, the one on the left, thus survives as a record of this short-lived army and may have been painted slightly after its abolishment, a dating I suggest on the basis of another painting from the same set, this extraordinary depiction of the Sultan. Whereas most of the late albums feature recognizable likenesses of the reigning sovereign, the portrait in the Fitzwilliam set, um, uniquely as far as I know, shows the sultan from the back, though his status is evident from his turban and from the Greek caption, which states, quote, monarch who is standing on the dais for the Mevlud, the uh, celebration of the prophet's nativity. Why has the artist taken such an unprecedented approach? Part of the answer surely lies in the impression of spontaneity and first-hand access that such a pose evokes. We might believe that the painter actually saw the Sultan from this view and made a mental sketch of the scene before committing it to paper. The conceit capitalizes on the image's naturalism, which stylistically reinforces the idea of a real-life moment. <laughs> 
the painter is, in a sense, beating Western artists, Western artists at their own game, deploying the tricks of pictorial verisimilitude to better sell his emic viewpoint. But another possible reason for this unusual portrait, one not um, exclusive of the first, is that the, image, that is that the image was created at a time when it was very much in doubt how long the present sultan would be around. This would encourage us to date the picture to the start of the reign of Mahmud II, who came to power in 1808 after the brief reign of Mustafa IV, who succeeded Selim III with the help of the Janissaries, but was himself dethroned after only one year. Mahmud was thus the third sultan in the space of 14 months, so that any artist producing a costume book at this time would have been wise to hedge his bets and paint a royal portrait that might continue to serve its purpose even after another regime change. Such examples demonstrate the capacity of the later costume albums for self-renewal within the bounds of the genre's intrinsically repetitive workings, that even the most recurrent types were newly and locally painted on each occasion was enough to guard against the kind of anachronism or unreliable parroting that threatened Western printed depictions. Nevertheless, production of the albums dried up after the 1820s, though interest in Ottoman dress remained high. The obvious explanation, which is that photography took over where painting left off, turns out not to be the case for while, as we shall see, Ottoman photographers certainly embraced sartorial themes, uh, photographic costume albums did not replace their painted forerunners as a common object type. What really seems to have spelled the end of the costume albums was, ironically <coughs> enough, something they themselves had anticipated, the Ottoman dress reforms. These were launched by Mahmud II, who, despite his reign's turbulent inception, proved to be a highly capable monarch who would remain in power until his death in 1839. Picking up Selim III's mantle, Mahmud instituted a new European-style infantry in 1826, and when the Janissaries rose up in rebellion, he simply sla slaughtered them en masse, and thus removed in one fell swoop any serious opposition. On the back of his military reforms came sweeping changes to the empire's dress codes. In 1829, Mahmud led by example and commanded his male subjects, or at least those of the middle and upper classes, to replace their traditional headgear and robes with fezes, frock coats, and trousers. This far-reaching change paved the way for the more comprehensive program of civil reforms known as the Tanzimat, which Mahmud's successors would, successors would pursue from 1839 onward. In this radically changed concept, context, a non-Muslim Ottoman gentleman was indistinguishable from his Muslim counterpart and barely distinguishable from the Sultan. Western observers of the overhaul were generally dismayed at what they regarded as a loss of a picturesque tradition. But for the Ottomans themselves, these developments were consistent with the ongoing process of cultural and political refashioning that had started in the 18th century. I'll wait for that to go by. Um, the album painters, however, now found their subject matter drastically and detriment detrimentally curtailed. Not only were the reformed costumes less varied among themselves, but they were also markedly less exotic in the eyes of Westerners. It was then sartorial rather than pictorial homogenization that proved an insurmountable problem for the artists, whose well-honed ability to depict the latest fashions offered little advantage now that the fashions themselves had lost their cross-cultural appeal. Uh, we might wonder, and I certainly have wondered, why the painters did not ignore the outcome of the reforms and simply carry on depicting the older assortment of costumes. This is a conundrum that I cannot yet begin to answer, though the apparent non-existence of retrospective albums is itself testament to how thoroughly the genre was tied to the conditions of the day, no matter how long standing or formulaic some of its elements may have been. The end of the painted albums did not spell the end of the kind of imagery in which they dealt, and other art forms soon emerged to feed the continuing Western fascination for traditional Ottoman costume. This was, after all, the age of Orientalism. Far from pandering to, to expectations, however, the Ottomans began to invoke their sartorial heritage in ways that transcended its colorful attributes and bespoke the empire's modernity, 
a point underscored by the use of new media. A striking example, oh, sorry, oh, there we go, they're the wrong way around. Um, a striking example is the um, LBC Atika, or Museum of Ancient Costume, a government-backed private enterprise that opened in Istanbul in 1852 and continued in various iterations into the early 20th century. Prominently located on the Hippodrome, the museum consisted of some 140 wooden mannequins wearing pre-reform garb of mainly military nature. We have no um, clear visual documentation of, of the museum in its original installation, but it survived. The, the mannequins kept being moved to various other institutions, and what you're seeing um, uh, in the photographs are later installations of it. Um, the reason this building here, which some of you may recognize in the palace of 16th century palace of Ibrahim Pasha, which is today the Museum of Turkish and Islamic Arts on the Hippodrome, the reason I include this is because this appears to be where this museum was. So this actually was the first museum on this site. And the mannequins appear to have been arranged um, all around the, the uh, porticos of the, museum, of the building. Many of the figures uh, included in the Elbise Atika came straight from the pages of the costume albums and were themselves translated back into two dimensions in a popular book of lithographs created by the Italo-Levantine painter, Jean Brindesi. Its indebtedness to earlier imagery notwithstanding, the museum employed its material to a very different end, casting the costumes as relics of the past and the Ottomans themselves as an up-to-date society able to indulge in nostalgic self-representation. Such harking back was in itself a hallmark of European modernity, for the 19th century witnessed a more general tendency towards standardization in the continent's fashions, especially in male dress, prompting many societies to engage in romantic reflections on their historical and folkloric costume. The LBC Atika thus took its place alongside other exhibitions of the time, most famously Madame de Swords in London, that offered viewers startingly tangible recreations of bygone eras. Uh, Théophile Gautier, one of many Western visitors to the museum, fully understood its diachronic message, remarking that the displays had rendered, quote, almost contemporary costumes, historical antiquities, unquote. That the show used naturalistic figural sculptures, an entirely new art form in the Ottoman context, would have made its novelty all the more striking. A similar exhibition, this time using waxworks, was opened three years later in London as a sort of public relations exercise in aid of the Crimean War. Named the Oriental and Turkish Museum, the show was founded by the Istanbul-born Armenian Christopher Oskanyan, a convert to Protestantism who married an American woman and lived most of his life in New York, where, sporting his signature fez, he gave public lectures on Turkish life, ran a coffee house on Broadway, and served as Ottoman consul. And as an interesting aside, he was also one of the first students matriculated into the newly established New York University. A really interesting figure, and um, he's being worked on at the moment uh, by, what's, by Nora, what's her surname? Yes, there we go. Um, it was in New York in 1863 that Oskanyan created a mail-order photographic costume album, populated largely by himself, there he is, and members of his family, whose poses show no obvious knowledge of the earlier painted albums. Oskanyan's book anticipated the far more ambitious book of photographs sent by the Ottoman state to the 1873 Vienna World Exposition. Entitled El Bise Osmanie, or Costume Populaire de la Turquie, this, to my knowledge, is the only photographic work that bears direct comparison to the much earlier painted albums. And the visual uh, similarities are at times remarkable. So here we see our vendor again. The book's diverse array of costumes, all of them cont contemporaneous, cleverly elides the new dress codes by focusing on lower class and regional dress which had been minimally affected by the reforms. As with the Museum of Ancient Costumes, however, the picturesque here serves a modernizing identity, one that, in this instance, is built not on the empire's past, but on its status as a vast colonizing power with the resources to taxonomize its populations using cutting edge and internationally prestigious technologies. The overtly ideological framing of these later ventures raises a number of important points in relation to the painted costume albums that preceded them. Uh, 
especially with regard to periodization. It is clear enough, and not especially surprising, that 19th century modernity ushered in a sharper awareness among the Ottomans of their sartorial order and its place in the world. But to what extent does this awareness differ from the keen self-perception underlying earlier costume portrayals? Is the corrective impulse we see in the painted albums a matter of marketing savvy only? Or is there something more culturally invested at play, what we might anachronistically think of as a sort of incipient national pride? I pose this as an open question, one with which I'm very much grappling. At the very least, the albums and their successor art forms are linked by a shared assertiveness in how they address the foreign viewer. The politically fraught circumstances of the 19th century raised the stakes on this existing dynamic and encouraged more knowing and programmatic strategies for responding to, and perhaps even reshaping, European impressions of the empire. That the state itself became involved in this enterprise goes a long way to explaining the development of a more targeted mode of address than that we saw in the commercially produced albums. This heightened consciousness of the semiotics of dress did not, however, operate solely on the level of cross-cultural communication. As I've already suggested in my reference to nostalgia, the Ottomans too were implicated <coughs> as spectators in the various performances being staged in the 19th century context. The shift is already heralded by the costume albums themselves, for there is evidence from these years that at least some later examples were being made for local consumption, as seems to have been the case with this uh, well-known example dated 1811. Um, there's very little evidence that costume albums before the 19th century had been locally consumed. Costume album type imagery, yes, but not sort of these encyclopedic costume albums. This more self-conscious attitude towards costume inevitably gains steam after the dress reforms. And it is important to note that the LBC Atika, though mostly frequented by foreign tourists and diplomats, was also open to Ottoman visitors, including women. In a similar vein, the LBC Osman, the LBC Osman yeah, so the um, photographic album made for Vienna, was in principle conceived with native viewers entered into the equation its textual content written in Ottoman as well as French and German. Multiple audiences led to multiple readings, and we cannot assume that the Ottomans succeeded in imposing or even hoped to impose a monolithic vision. Where well-to-do Istanbulites might have regarded such imagery as proof of how far they had come, many foreigners might, have, might well have contented themselves with delighting in the familiar exoticism of so much oriental splendor. Nevertheless, I'm conceived that even the most seemingly self-orientalizing displays had the potential to move their viewers to recognize Ottoman modernity. And I cannot help mention, mentioning in this regard that one of the authors of the LBC Osmaniye was Osman Hamdibe, the famous Ottoman orientalist who has been credited by some art historians with subverting the very genre in which he worked. So note uh, these ladies with bustles and parasols, very 19th century ladies indeed. Um, instrumentalizing their perceived exoticism for the purpose of superseding it, the Ottomans were able, in Zeynep Çelik's words, to speak back to Orientalist discourse. And, and it is surely a measure of their success in this regard that even the most lascivious Western-produced Orient Orientalist paintings of the second half of the 19th century usually evoke an Arab or otherwise provincial milieu rather than a Constantinopolitan one. Um, and even Jerome's iconic snake charmer, despite its identifiable borrowings from the tile work of the top cup of palace there in the background, even this painting um, seems to locate itself far from the Ori Ottoman capital. Even more than the painted albums then, these later forms of sartorial self-representation reveal the imbrications and entanglements that characterized and increasingly complicated the relationship between local and foreign interests in Ottoman dress interests that could now converge on the same art forms while eliciting distinct yet related responses. This striking, if only partial, confluence would not have been possible before the 19th century, when Ottoman and uh, Western visual cultures became sufficiently aligned to allow for it. A situation that had proved detri a detrimental blow to the albums thus served as a productive point of departure for the newer media that took their place. Even so, and as I have shown, the transition we have traced here did not constitute a clear-cut break, and one of the demands of working on a project of such chronological scope 
is to resist the urge to pigeonhole the material according to uh, uh, preconceived notions of modern and early modern. Uh, displays like the LBC Atika and the LBC Osmania pr uh, prove the enduring impact of the album tradition, even as they confirmed its obsolescence. Having fostered the foreign interest in Ottoman costume that the later mannequins and photographs would exploit, the albums fell victim to the very circumstances that would give rise to their successors, though not without bequeathing a host of well-worn themes and motifs that stood to be given new meanings relevant to the transformed socio-political climate. Some of the paintings, as we have seen, themselves were themselves embedded in this shift as records of a changing sartorial, political, and artistic order. In its final form, then, the Ottoman costume album became a genre that visualized the conditions of its own imminent demise, capturing the moment just before the startling makeover that would consolidate the empire's new image. Thank you. <laughs>